right. Well, good morning, Salem. Good morning. God is good. And all the time. It is great to see you here this morning. My name is Eric, one of the pastors here at Salem Reformed Church. Uh, we gather here in our historic sanctuary. The pews that you sit on were the original pews when the sanctuary was built in 1822, so a lot of butts had been in your pew. Uh, so we uh, gather here this morning to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, like many of our brothers and sisters in Christ through this church has been doing. And, uh, you know, we've all had different weeks this week. We've had, uh, some of us had a very uh, joyful week, a very blessed week. Some of us have a very trying week, a, a trial week. I'm not referring to the election. I'm just referring to life in general before you guys go there with that. But just in general, you know, we all come from different backgrounds here, but yet we gather here this morning to worship Jesus Christ. That is our sole purpose and reason why uh, we are here today. Before we get into our time of worship, as always, we have our announcements and acknowledgments. And our acknowledgments is going to be a little bit different, a little bit more special here today, as tomorrow is in our national holidays, our Veterans Day here in our country. So we want to take a moment and recognize, give appreciation, and acknowledge our veterans here this morning as well. So as far as announcements go, one announcement that's not in your bulletin, the rest are in your bulletin. So make sure you read through your bulletin so you get all the details. Uh, the, the announcement that's not in your bulletin, as you see when you walked in here this morning, I see some of you have already gotten them. Uh, we have our uh, Christmas present drive that we do every year where we team up uh, with three local schools in the area, elementary schools, and uh, we try to be a blessing uh, to some of the students in those schools who might wake up Christmas morning with no presents, and so we kind of... Uh, we adopt them, so to speak. We don't know their names. We just know their age and their details. And we ask you to go and purchase presents for those kids. And so how it works, as we do every year, is we have a small little tree out in our foyer. Renee's out there now, where we have uh, just numbers and letters on ornaments. Uh, that is the information and details of the child that you'd be getting. So right now we have 35 children. Uh, but when everything is said and done, we'll have about 70 children that we will sponsor and help and uh, donate to this year. Uh, so thank you in advance. If you didn't get a chance as you walked in to grab an ornament uh, before you leave today, the tree will still be back there. If you want to go out that direction to get an ornament, you can do so. Again, Renee's there now. I'm sure she'll be there after service if you have any questions about that. We are asking that the Christmas presents come back December the 1st, and they come back individually wrapped. So don't take, uh, if you have someone, we've had, we've had folks do this in the past, where maybe you buy multiple gifts and you wrap it in one box, which I understand the convenience of that, but we ask that you would wrap it individually, uh, each item that you purchase for your child. And then if you could put it in a big bag with a list, that would be great uh, for us. So if you can help out with that, that would be great. Also, another help, our North Carolina relief help that we've been doing, uh, our our. Uh, Family Life Center foyer and even near the office, uh, is, there's more and more stuff accumulating there, so thank you so much for your donations. This will be your last week to give any kind of donations. You can read in your bulletin what you can uh, donate at this time, but we're going to be loading the bus next Saturday, the 16th at 1 o'clock, so we ask that all donations be here at the church by 1 o'clock next Saturday. We're going to pray for a team that's going to be going down. I think it's a team of six guys that are going to be going down early Sunday morning. They're going to go down Sunday morning, and they're going to come back late Tuesday night. They're going to go down, take all the stuff, deliver the stuff, see what's going on in their own eyes, come back and report to us what other areas we can help with them as well. So, if again, you want to give a donation, make sure it's here by Saturday, 1 o'clock. Make sure you're here for the mission dinner. I know Pastor Brent's going to talk about that a little bit more later in the service, but make sure you're here next Saturday for the mission dinner. It's at 6 o'clock in our Family Life Center. A wonderful night of breaking bread together and talking about missions here at Salem. No calls to you. We just invite you to come on out to that. But at that time, we will pray for the six that are going to be going down to North Carolina as well. Last thing I just want to mention is we have our Thanksgiving Eve worship gathering coming up here in a few weeks. We hope that you would join us in that. It's Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. It's always a wonderful service we do every year. So make plans to join us on that Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. All right, as far as acknowledgments go this morning, we'll do birthdays and anniversaries here first. As far as birthdays go, we have uh, Joy Ebersol celebrating a birthday, Nevaeh Shive celebrating her birthday, Andrea Carball celebrating her birthday, Bill Cushwall celebrating his birthday, Barb Jacob celebrating her birthday, Sonia Persiak, who's in the uh, upper room, celebrating her birthday, Donna Mae Tedrick celebrating her birthday, and Ava Sullivan celebrating her birthday. So quite a few birthdays 
uh, here this week, and we also have an anniversary, uh, Roy and Pam Embersall. Roy, how many years? How many? 40. 40 years on the dot. Congratulations on that. Are there any other birthdays or anniversaries we could be missing here this morning? All right, let's take a moment and let's sing happy birthday and happy anniversary to all those celebrating one. Happy birthday. As I said, today's uh, this morning of our acknowledgement time is a little bit more special. Uh, as you know, tomorrow here in our country is Veterans Day, and we want to just take a moment here before we get into our time of worship to recognize, acknowledge, and give thanks to all of those uh, who have served our country. Uh, regardless of the armed forces you serve, we appreciate you very much. This is our Veterans Day where we acknowledge those vets who are here with us who are served our country. So this is how we're going to do it. I have a list here of some names that I'm going to read. If I read off your name, I ask that you would please stand and remain standing during the duration of this list. If I read someone's name and you are a loved one of theirs and you know if they're not here, there's lots of sicknesses going around. Some of these folks are homebound people. If you can stand in representation of them, we would appreciate that. And again, that we ask that you would remain standing as well. Ernest Barnhart, David Barr, Robert Beckley III, Brandon Bridges, Michael Klein, Jack Kaufelt, Kirk Davis, Roger Davis, Tony Davis, Daryl Ebersol, Roy Ebersol, Wayne H. Ebersol, and Wayne L. Ebersol. Gary Everett, Ronald Fry, Carl Gearhart, Daniel Hilden, George Hill, Richard Lesher, Ernest Martin Jr., Edward Maddox, Bob Miller, Stephen Moores, Jerry Moore, Adam Shiflett, Carl Spiker, Jay Stauffer, and Philip is here with us this morning. We want to acknowledge Philip's father, who actually served in World War II. So, Philip Downs, can you stand for your father, Charles Downs? Is there anyone else here who has served our country that we have missed you here this morning? We ask that if you could please stand and maybe state your name. We want to acknowledge you here. Larry. Can we just give a round of applause and thank you? Remain standing, please. Remain standing, remain standing, remain standing, remain standing. So this past Friday, I went to see Charlotte. Their school does a great job of a veterans program. Uh, it's my final year going for her, as she'll be in middle school next year. But one of the things that the principal said uh, to all the kids is make sure that you hug and thank a veteran. So if you guys can stand back up for me, for those of you who are standing up, and all of my children and youth, could you go and hug a veteran real quick for me? Let's make sure every veteran gets a hug. Come on, we know who the youth are and the children are. Could you give them a hug? And as our children are doing that, adults, won't you help them out and shake the hand and thank the person next to you that's standing up? Let's make sure all these veterans get a nice hug. 
family members of the veterans get a nice hug as well. We appreciate you all very much. There we go. Awesome. Awesome. Again, thank you all very much. We hope you all enjoy your day tomorrow on Veterans Day. Let's all just remember, spend some time tomorrow in prayer, thanking God for our veterans, thanking God for all the people standing here today. And also family members. I have family members. I'm sure you have family members uh, that have served our country and are still possibly serving our country. So let's be praying for them uh, tomorrow as well. All right, to ready our hearts for worship here this morning, I'm going to ask Jemima to please come forward as she's going to read to us our call to the repentance scripture for us out of Romans chapter 5. Today's call to gospel scripture is from Romans 5 through 6. Five, Romans 5 verse 6 through 11. Here is the reading God's word. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for the righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare to even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we will... For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his death of his son, much more, having, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Let's take a moment and meditate on the gospel as of as on the gospel to clear our hearts for worship. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to you here this morning, as we heard from Romans 5, as Jemima read for us, while we were yet sinners, Christ, you died for us. This past week, Lord, while we were yet sinners, your cross became a reality to us. This morning, while we are yet sinners, your cross becomes a reality to us. We are so thankful for your forgiveness, your love and grace and mercy. And Lord, we gather here this morning to worship you and acknowledge here today that in order to worship you, we need a, a clean heart. We need the reality of the cross, the reality of your blood to cleanse us. And so we acknowledge that we have sinned this past week. We've sinned perhaps even coming in here this morning. We have baggages that we bring here, Lord, and we want to take this moment to just lay it all down at your feet, to confess our sins and to lay down those baggages. And so church, let's just take a moment, silently in our hearts, confess our sins, lay down those baggages, and repent to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, for hearing our prayers. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you that you are our great God. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name.
Amen. I invite you, if you're able, to please stand as we sing some songs to the Lord. Our first song that we're going to sing here is led by our praise team, How Great Is Our God. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for another day, another gift of life, and just another opportunity, Father, to do your will. You are the one who holds all things together by your mighty power. We stand in awe of your holiness, knowing that you are beyond our understanding, yet you draw near to us with your love and grace. You are worthy of all praise. Your greatness is unsearchable. Your goodness is infinite and your faithfulness endures forever we praise you for your perfect wisdom your boundless grace and your endless love you called us by name we thank you father for sending your son jesus to redeem us through his sacrifice on the cross we have been reconciled to you forgiven and made new we worship you lord not just for what you have done but for who you are our savior our king our shepherd and our friend we lift our hearts and voices in worship, acknowledging that you alone are worthy of our devotion. Help us to live each day to give you honor and praise. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
church just remain standing as we sing, There is one God. And you may be seated. I'm going to invite Pastor Brent to come forward here today. He's going to share with us a mission moment, a couple moments he's actually sharing. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, the mission dinner next week, but also give us an update on the Stabell family. All right, good morning. Um, we do have a missions dinner coming up on uh, Saturday night, this uh, the 16th at 6 p.m., and we would love for everyone to come, and I, th I think there's good reason for everyone to come. Let me give some of the reasons. Uh, first, the Indian food. Um, now, that's a reason for some of you to come. It's a reason for others not to come, But ho so hold on. Uh, th the Indian food will be awesome. There's like three or four Indian spices with, with rice and, and uh, bread, maybe with garlic on the bread, and... Um, Mike works with someone who's going to bring authentic Indian uh, stuff. And uh, so, so come and enjoy the Indian food. If you've loved Indian food, you'll, you'll like it. And if you haven't had Indian food before, you might, you might really love it. And, but, but if you're afraid of the spices and anything like that, then there will be plain chicken and rice, plain chicken and, and bread. Uh, so don't be afraid. Come anyway. And Anna's going to make some sweet tea to go along with it all. Uh, so that's, that's the food. Um, 
Now, uh, those who were involved in Work Camp 24 uh, this year um, in Frederick should come because we'll, we'll do a report on that, show pictures, and, and talk about what happened in Frederick in 24. And then with, uh, we need to talk about what's going to happen in 25 this summer, um, th this summer with Work Camp hosted by Salem in Hagerstown. So um, come and, and hear about all that. And anybody, if in, any of you, any of the youth that were involved in that, please come. Um, we would love to see children. We'd love to see adults. We'd love to see uh, elderly folks. Everyone uh, can come. Mike will be at the back of the church uh, with a sign-up list right after the service, and I'll be at the front. Um, so you, 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 you can't escape without um, making a decision about whether you come on Saturday. And so try to sign up if you think you'll come. Um, but if you don't sign up and, and, and you realize I should have signed up, this is going to be the greatest thing, then come anyway. Okay. Uh, don't, don't worry that you haven't signed up, but do sign um, so that we can get a proper count and, and prepare well. Um, we'll also talk about a mission, missions prayer fellowship, which will be kicked off by the missions committee um, early next year. And that, that's, that can be central to the life of our church, to our looking to God, looking to the mountain of the Lord. Eschatologically, we say, looking to the end. <laughs> what are we all here for? What are we all doing? It's not in the news, folks. But it's in, in, in the word of God, chapter after chapter after chapter, as Eric has been preaching. Um, so, so we want to we want to put our hearts there. We want to put our minds there. And we can do that through a missions prayer fellowship. And we'll talk about that a little bit on Saturday night as well. OK, now the people that we've already sent out um, are the Stabels, um, uh, along with Amelia in Ecuador, the Stabels in Congo. Uh, the Stabels, Mark and Amy, uh, you'll remember them standing, m most of you will remember them standing here before us, before they went there, uh, with their three young boys, I won't mention their names, but, but they're now in Congo, and uh, we, we really need to pray for them. Uh, they, they face a lot of hurdles. Uh, you can tell they're seasoned folks. They've been out there before. They know what they're doing, um, but still, you know, um, there, there are a lot of obstacles to overcome. So one of the first was to rearrange their schooling situation. They, they faced un, unexpected circumstances when they got to the field. So starting school this year has involved decisions about curriculum and education and where to do this and, and who will be the teachers and what the schedules look, will look like and, and how to do all that with, I think there are five um, uh, families that are on the field with them that they're coordinating with. So pray that that goes well. Pray that their housing situation uh, is, is easy to settle into. They're in a new, new home, a new place. They, they have to deal with, you know, bureaucracy, government visas and all of that, continue to pray for those things. And, and, and maybe most of all on their hearts is their relationships with Congolese people. Um, they work in a hospital. Um, they're both medical folks. And, and they want to do that work well, and they've already been able to play a role in saving uh, the life of a baby. But, but pray that, you know, daily, day in and day out, they'll be able to do that with confidence and grace and, and have those relationships which point people to Christ. Uh, pray that the relationships for their boys in, in that community will be really good. And, and lastly, they've realized since they got there that they really need to buy a car. They need to be able to drive places. And uh, so they've set up a car fund. If anybody is interested in giving to that fund for a car, uh, let us know. Could I pray for them and for us? Lord Jesus, I thank you uh, for what you're doing around the world, among the nations, for your glory, for your honor, God. Uh, you're doing much more than we see around us. You are always busy. You are always moving. You are always arranging uh, the affairs of nations so that your name will be known so that you will be known as the true and saving God. So we, uh, we've worshipped you this morning, and we desire that all peoples worship you, and we know that one day all nations, all languages, all tribes and tongues will be gathered around a holy throne in heaven where there is no doubt about who is king and who is Lord and who is exalted over all. So, God, we pray for the Stabels. We pray that you would give them the energy and, and encouragement and perseverance and and. Uh, family joys, um, and, and uh, all, all those things that they need from your Holy Spirit to do the work that you've called them to do. Lord, we pray that you would bless them. We pray that you would provide for them. We pray that their ability to work in the hospital and, and yet uh, to reach people's hearts and to serve people 
uh, in all aspects of their lives would really uh, be effective and productive by your grace and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brent. I hope, do hope to see you on Saturday night as we gather. It's going to be a wonderful night together. Make sure you sign up before you leave here today. Yeah, we gather here to worship our Lord through song. We gather here to worship our Lord through the preaching and receiving of his word, through prayer, through fellowship with one another. We also gather here to worship our Lord through our tithes and our offerings. It is a spiritual act of worship. We are called in scripture to give our tithes, give our offering unto the Lord, to worship him through that. And uh, our tithes go to the work and ministry here at Salem Reformed Church. And our offering, which is above and beyond our tithe, goes towards the missions like the Stabell family that we heard about here this morning. So not only do we want to pray for them, but as a church, we want to financially come alongside of them as well. To make sure that we have a heart of worship as we give our tithes and offerings, I invite you, if you're able to please stand as we together sing the glory of Patrick. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the blessings and you give us each day. We ask that you would help us to understand that giving is a joyful act of worship. Father, we ask that you would bless these gifts, though in material, and bless our leadership who will discern how to best use them according to your will. Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing our psalm, Psalm 16, verse 1 through 6, to the tune, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Oh, keep me safe, my God. Amen. You may be seated. And children, want you to come forward to the cross here this morning for your children's message before you head down to continue your rehearsal for the Christmas program.
Good morning. How is everybody doing this morning? Good. So have you ever wondered if there's a place where you could go where God wouldn't be with you? Maybe on a high mountain or deep in the ocean or what about even in space? The Bible tells us that no matter where we go, God is always there with us. He never leaves our side. This means that whether you're at home, at school, or even on a trip far away, like vacation, God is always there with you, watching over you, and is loving you. It's like having a best friend who is always by your side, ready to listen and help whatever you need. You can talk to God anytime, anywhere, and he will listen. Isn't that amazing that you're never alone? He's always with you? Yeah? Okay, let's say a little prayer. Dear God, thank you for always being with me, no matter where I go. Help me to remember that you are always near, and I can talk to you whenever I need to. Amen. All right, folks, if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, do me a favor, open up to Deuteronomy. We're still in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 10 today. We're going to consider verse 12, um, verse, what are we doing? 12 through 22 uh, here this morning. So Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 through 22. If you're using a pew Bible, if you don't have a Bible with you, you could pick up that pew Bible, use that. Turn to page 196. So as you're opening up your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 10, Let me just lay a foundation, uh, tell you what we're going to be doing uh, here this morning. Uh, As I said last Sunday, we are in the home stretch, the final lap of a series that we started back in August uh, called Missions in the Torah. Again, Torah is the first five books of the Bible, starts with Genesis, uh, ends with Deuteronomy. These are penned by Moses. Moses, though, is not the ultimate author. The author is the Lord himself, God himself, the Holy Spirit who inspires Moses to write the words that he writes. And what we are doing is we are looking at the first five books of the Bible, not necessarily going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, because we'd be in a much larger series than just 14 weeks if we were to do that. But we're hitting on some of the key stories that we normally find in these first five books. And we're looking at these key, very well-known stories through the lens of missions. And what we mean by missions is what God calls every single follower of his, that we are called to be missional. We are called to make disciples. We are called to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. We are called to shine the glory of God. Now, some people are called to do that in full-time ministry, like the Sabell family, as God calls them to go to a nation like Congo. But all of us are called to do that, whether if it's in our homes, our backyards, our, our schools that God has us in, the workplaces that God has us in. We are called to be on mission. And this concept of being on mission for God, as we've been saying throughout this entire series, is not just a New Testament concept. It's not just something that Jesus brought to the table when he came here in his earthly presence, but that God has always desired and always commanded his people, even all the way from the foundations in the beginning of the world, to be his instruments, to be his vessels, to share the salvation of God, to let people know who God is, to let the nations see the glory of God. And so we are looking at the first five books of the Bible, hitting some of these very familiar stories, and looking at them through the lens of mission, looking at them through the lens that we are called to be on mission for God. And so we're in Deuteronomy here. We'll be in Deuteronomy next week and then the following week, and then we will wrap up uh, this series here, Missions in the Torah. And again, Deuteronomy is an interesting book here. It's the fifth and final book of the first five. Again, it's penned by Moses, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And what's happening here in the timeline and context of things is Moses is pretty much the last of the generation that was to die off, the rebellious generation that did not want to walk into the promised land because they saw these big, huge giants here, and they lacked the faith that God could help them inherit 
that promised land. And so God had them wander for 40 years, so that generation can be gone. That generation is pretty much gone up to this point. Moses, again, is one of the last few ones. Now the new upcoming generation is ready to inherit and to receive the promised land that God has set aside for Israel. And so they are, uh, they are literally at the Jordan, getting ready to cross the Jordan. And what Moses is inspired by God to do is to give him one more last hurrah. Before he gives his leadership over to Joshua, God leads him to essentially preach this very, very long sermon. And the premise of Deuteronomy is as this upcoming generation comes in, to remember the faithfulness and the goodness of God and to encourage this new generation that will now take the leadership and go into the promised land to keep their hearts and their minds and their affections on God alone. To not be swayed away, to not let fear, to not let false gods come in and infiltrate them, but to keep their focus on God and God alone. Essentially what Moses is telling them is don't be like your mom and dad. Don't have the fear, don't sway away, stay steadfast on the Lord. And in our particular chapter today, Moses draws these, this generation, this new generation coming up, draws them back to the book of Exodus, draws them back into the history of Israel, draws them back to when Moses was on Mount Sinai to receive the commandments. And as Moses was up there for a very lengthy time, Israel became impatient, and they built what is famously known as the golden calf. They rebelled against God, and God broke, through Moses, God broke those tablets, those original ten tablets, and in this chapter, God is talking, or Moses, so I say, is talking about the forgiveness of God, the love of God, and how even God provided new tablets with the commandments on it itself. And so for the first few verses here of this chapter, he is talking about the faithfulness of God. Moses is talking about the goodness of God, the greatness of God. Moses is talking about the love of God towards his people. And then when we get to verse 10 and the passage that we're going to consider today, what we see here now is Moses instructing Israel on how they should respond to God. Because of God's great love for them, this is how they should respond. And essentially, as we're going to see here today, they should respond very simply with this. Love God and love the nations. Their response to the great love of God that God has for them should simply be this. Love God and love nations. And why we are looking at this through the lens of missions is because of this. Last week, as we looked at early on in Deuteronomy, we saw last week that in order for us to truly be on mission, we need to live to the word of God. That there is this thing called gospel demonstration and gospel proclamation. We need to demonstrate the gospel, but we also need to proclaim the gospel. And we need to do both those things together. And as we obey the law of God, we will demonstrate the gospel. And so obeying the law of God, obeying God's word is imperative for you and I to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. But you and I, even though we can't be witnesses of Christ unless we obey the word of God, you and I, as we see in our passage today, can't obey the word of God unless we love him. So as you think about missions, you think about being missional in our backyards, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, as we look as a church to see how we can be missional globally, without love, it fails. Without love, it falls short. Love is central. Central. In fact, when Jesus was asked the question by the religious leaders, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus responded with, love the Lord God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one was what? Love your neighbor as yourself. And then what does Jesus say? He says, all the laws and prophets fall underneath these two. For example, one of the laws and the commands that God gives Israel and now he gives the church is very simply this, to go and be witnesses of him. You and I are commanded. This is not an option for believers. This is a command of God to make disciples, every one of us here. And Jesus simply says, if you love God 
and you love others, all these commands, all these laws, all these prophecies that you read about in the Word of God, they will fall underneath that. You will be able to walk in those commands if you love. So love is so central. So that said, if you're able, will you please stand as we formally read this passage of Scripture here today from Deuteronomy chapter 10. Again, we're going to consider verse 12 through 22 here this morning. Here is the reading of God's word. Let us hear it and receive it together. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all of your hearts, with all of your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, the Lord your God belong heaven... Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens and the earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is this day. So circumcise your hearts and stiffen your neck no longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords the great and the mighty, the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. So show your love for the alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and cling to him, and you shall swear by his name. He is your praise, he is your God, who has done these great and awesome things which, for which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons in all, and now the Lord your God has made you numerous as the stars of heaven. Here ends the reign of God's holy and perfect word. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And so what we're going to do here today is talk about the love that we have for God and the love that we are called to have with others, the love that we're called to have to the nations. The big idea of today's message, if there's one statement that you can at least go home and allow the Holy Spirit to work on your heart is this, that the central focus of our Christian life, those who are redeemed and walking with God, here it is, the central focus of our Christian life is simply this, Love the Lord and love the nations. The central focus of our Christian life is love the Lord and love the nations. And so what we're doing here this morning is as we talk about our love for God and our love for the nations is try to ask and answer three simple questions. And each question is going to be this. As we look at the love of God, we ask ourselves, why is it important to love God? Second question is, how do we love God? The third question is, what reasons should we love God? And then we're going to do the same three questions as we talk about loving the nations. Why is it important to love the nations? How do we love the nations? And what is the reasons to love the nations? So first, as we talk about the love of God, which is really profoundly found in this passage of Scripture. Again, Moses, prior to this passage that we read, talked about the goodness and faithfulness of God, even during the rebellion and the stiff-neckedness that Israel displayed. God has been good and faithful and has showered them with love and love and love. And in response, in return, Moses cannot be any more clear here that we respond to the love of God with love towards God. And the reason why loving God is so important, I want to read to you actually a quote by C.S. Lewis. Most of you probably know C.S. Lewis and probably know him mostly from his books that he wrote, Chronicles of Narnia, but he wrote other fantastic books as well. C.S. Lewis says this great quote, Every Christian would agree that a man's spiritual health is exactly proportional to his love for God. Let me read that again. Every Christian would agree that man's spiritual health is exactly proportional to his love for God. 
what C.S. Lewis is saying here simply is this, that we are called to grow in our walk with Jesus. We're called to have a healthy walk with God, to be healthy spiritually. And C.S. Lewis says that our love for God goes hand in hand with that. And the reason why our love for God goes hand in hand to our spiritual health and whether we are growing spiritually is because as we see very clearly in scripture, obedience and love go hand in hand. In fact, we are taught in scripture that obedience without love is truly not biblical obedience and love without obedience is truly not biblical love. That both of these go hand in hand. So naturally, as C.S. Lewis is saying, as we love God, we walk in obedience. As we walk in obedience, we become healthier and healthier and healthier spiritually in our walk with Jesus. Jesus even says, if you love me, you will obey my what? Commands. Obedience and love, my friends, go hand in hand, side by side. I used the great analogy last week that you all Amen and 100% agree with me. It's like peanut butter and jelly, the best sandwich that you can eat, right? Peanut butter and jelly. It's, it's just that obedience and love smashed together as one. You see, because this is what happens. When we try to, quote, unquote, walk in obedience without the centralness of our love for God, then all we become is nothing but legalistic rule followers. So what I mean by this is that you can serve on mission trips. You can give your tithes and offerings. You can come to church every Sunday. You can sing these hymns. You can read your Bible. You can pray. You can do all these things which we are called to do. But if we do this in the emptiness of love, all we're simply doing is just being a bunch of rule followers. And obedience and rule following is two different things because obedience or love, should I say, is central to obedience in our lives. We should be going on those mission trips. We should be reading our Bible. We should be praying. We should be coming to church. We should be doing all these things. We should be giving our tithes and offerings, which is a spiritual act of worship, all central to love, that love is the root of it. As we study in the Old Testament, do you know there is times where God told Israel, point blank, stop giving me your sacrifices. By the way, this is the same God who commanded them how to sacrifice in detail. When you do this, this should be the animal you sacrifice. When you do that, that should be, I mean, good thing for Pharisees to tell you, because I'd be totally confused. Okay, I did this today. What kind of animal should I sacrifice here? And yet God is the one who gives these sacrifices. And yet at times, as we read in the Old Testament, God tells Israel, I don't want your sacrifice. Why? Because in those moments, they were nothing but rule followers, and they weren't being obedient because their sacrificing that they were given was not anchored in love. They were simply just going through the motions. And if we just are people that go through the... Christian motions with no anchor of love. My friends, we can say all we want that, that that is obedience, and it may even look like obedience, but at the end of the day, it's not obedience. Because love and obedience must go hand in hand. Well, on the flip side of that, the same works with love. Again, love and obedience go hand in hand. To have love without obedience is not truly love. I've already said this once, but Jesus simply says in the Gospels, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Our love for God will always overflow out into a walk with obedience. That's why those who profess to be Christians and, and teach messages that we're, we're, we're all about love and we're not going to talk about sin and we're not going to talk about obedience and we're not going to talk about those things, have a warped view of what biblical love is. Because biblical love always produces biblical obedience. 
Love without obedience is not love at all. And maybe love according to how we define it as the world and according to man's ideology, but according to how God describes what love is and our love for him, love without obedience is not truly biblical love. Now, I'm not saying here this morning that you and I should be these perfect, holy, always constantly obedient people. Now, does God call us to be holy? Does God call us to walk in righteousness? Does God desire us for us to walk in obedience? Yes. But we are going to stumble. We are going to fall. We are going to sin. We are still sinners. We struggle with our flesh. This is the difference because I don't want anyone leaving here today saying, oh, I really didn't do a good job obeying God this week. I must not love God. Because if we start going down that path, then we are going down a path of legalism. Legalism, as we see the Pharisees taught, is simply this, that you have to do X, Y, and Z in order to be saved. Legalism is not because of your love for God. It's so much that you want to serve God and obey God, and you strive to do what the Word of God says. That, that is what true biblical obedience is. But legalism teaches that you have to do these things to be saved. You have to do these things to be saved. And I'm not saying here today that when you have fallen short, as I have fallen short in obedience to God, that all of a sudden we're not saved because there's a huge difference here. When you are confronted of that fallen short, of that sin, and sometimes it's the Holy Spirit who confronts us of that sin, whether through his word, whether through prayer, and sometimes it's the Holy Spirit confronting us through that sin through our brothers and sisters in Christ as they speak truth to you. Maybe it's a sin that you've done towards them and they speak that sin to you. For those who are truly in Christ, we will fall short at times, but how we know we are in Christ is simply this. When we are confronted with that sin, just like David, our heart breaks. And our broken heart should lead us quickly into repentance. You see, a broken heart is much different than a guilty heart. You can be confronted of a sin and, and feel guilty and guilty and guilty, but never guilt, does it, I mean, does it trigger you to repentance? Perfect case of this is what we find in the New Testament between Judas and Peter. Judas felt bad. He felt remorse, the Bible says. He, he was guilty. He felt guilty of his sin that he did as he, as he betrayed Jesus. But it was guilt, not brokenness. Whereas Peter, who denied Jesus three times, Scripture says that he was broken. And his brokenness led him to repentance. See, that's the huge difference here. Yes, God calls us to obedience, and obedience must be rooted in love. We will fall short. We have fallen short this past week. How do I know whether or not I, I, am, a, I am a believer who has fallen short, or maybe I'm not a believer walking with Jesus? Well, the question is this. When you are confronted by that sin, by the Holy Spirit, no matter how he approaches you on that, are you broken? And does that brokenness lead you to a place of repentance. So listen, we can do some self-evaluation and we can ask ourselves, wait a minute, why am I not being obedient here? And maybe your lack of obedience is that, yeah, there is a sin in your life that God is trying to confront. But we can at times, God can do this, that maybe our lack of obedience is that we're not walking with the Lord. But that doesn't mean that all of a sudden for us to walk with the Lord, we have to be obedient. No, it means that we surrender our life to Christ. We're engulfed by his love. And the love of God consumes us so much and overflows out of us that we live obedient lives to him. Do you understand what I'm saying here? We're not saved through obedience. We're saved by the work and the love of God. And our obedience should be rooted in our love for him. That is exactly what Moses is saying here. And love and obedience go hand in hand, side by side. Which is why it's important. Because you and I, as we learned last week, 
unless we live out the word of God, we can't demonstrate the gospel. And you and I can't live out the word of God, quote, unquote, be obedient unless we love God. This is why loving God is central. It is the, it is the core of all things, my friends. We can do a series after missions, after missions, after missions. And we've been talking about missions since last August, 2023. We did a sermon series in the book of Acts. But if we don't have love, we miss it. We can have all the head knowledge we want. We can, we can know all the doctrines we want. We don't have love, we miss it. We can serve, we can serve, we can serve. We can take every student off that tree. If we don't have love, we miss it. Miss it. You understand what I'm saying? Love is so important here. So how do we love God? That's the big question here. How do we biblically love God? Well, first and foremost, you got to walk with him. you got to have a relationship with him. Love is not just something that you turn on. In fact, in our own capacity, we can't love God. We need to walk with God. And God allows us now to access him. Not by anything that we have done, but we can walk with God by everything God has done. Because the Father sent his son, Jesus Christ. We're going to be celebrating this here in just a few short weeks. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, born into this world in his flesh lived a holy and perfect life, did not sin. And as Jemima read for us earlier in our call to repentance out of Romans 5, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He who had no sin died for our sins. He took our sins, past, present, and future, and died with them on the tree. And he resurrected on the third day, overcoming death. It's all of what God has done. And scripture says, you and I just simply put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Scripture does not say that we have to have the right doctrine in place. Scripture doesn't say we have to do the right religious works in place. Scripture simply says, put your faith and trust and hope in Jesus Christ. Save in faith. Save in faith is comprehending. It's knowing in your mind that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Save in faith is confession. That you confess with your whole self that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And you're a sinner that can't do anything. And save in faith is commitment. It is a full, trusted commitment of surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. How do we love God? It starts by walking with God, by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then scripture tells us, it's so beautiful, that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we receive the third person of the Holy Spirit, of the Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives within us, and we have a new heart, and we have a new will, we have a new desire, and the Holy Spirit strengthens us and grows us in spiritual maturity so that now you and I, as we walk with God, this is amazing, we can walk in a way that we constantly live a life that loves him. So listen, we love God because of what God has done. God makes us right in his presence. It's all by him. We can't boast in salvation. And then in his salvation plan, he gives us the Holy Spirit, him himself, God himself, to reside and live within us. Oh, and by the way, he empowers us to walk with him every single day and love him. Isn't that awesome? As the scripture says twice, how awesome. Yes, the word awesome is not made up by a surfer from California. It's in the word of God. Come on, that was a funny joke. Come on, guys. It's in the word of God. He is an awesome God who redeems us and saves us and then empowers us through his presence to walk a life daily that we can love him. And how do we love him? Look at all what Moses says here. He's got a list of things. In this passage, 
he practically shows us what love in God looks like in everyday life. He says, number one, love in God is fear in the Lord your God. Fear. Fear here is a state of reverence. It's a state of awe. We should tremble in the presence of a holy God. How do we love God every day in our life? We live a life that fears God. He says that we also love God by walking in God's ways. Guys, how do we know what God's way is? We read the word of God. We meditate the word of God. We study the word of God. We walk in his ways. He also tells us that we, we love God by serving the Lord God with all of your hearts and with all of your soul. He says that we love God in this passage by keeping the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which he says are for our own good, by the way. He tells us that we can love God by circumcising your heart and stiffen your neck no more. I love these last two. He says we can love God by clinging to God. Jamie's not here this morning. Connor has been not well since really Wednesday nights. And uh, we got him through yesterday's birthday. We gave him ibuprofen and Tylenol, but this fever just keeps coming back and keeps coming back. So she's in urgent care with him right now. And I can bet you as they're sitting in urgent care, Connor is just clinging on to his mom. It's amazing that when our children are sick, they just cling on to us. Now, of course, they always share with us what their sickness is as they cling on to us. But I think there's a good analogy there. Because you and I are sick. We're sick in our sin. And we have the opportunity every day to cling to our Father. And just like Connor, who's sick and clinging to his mom right now, and wanting his mom to help him, and even take this sickness away. We cling to our Father. We cling to him to take the sickness of our sin away. There's something, I, I don't want to see my kids sick, but there's something beautiful when our kids are sick, and they just want to lay on our chest, or they just want to cuddle with us. That clinging on to us, that's the cleaning that we are to do to God. That in our sickness, we just, in our sickness of sin, we cling to him. And then it says, we swear by his name. Whenever we see this in scripture, this idea of swearing by God's name, this is about committal. That we commit our lives, we lay our lives down, that we swear an oath that our life is God's life. So we fear him, we serve him, we read here, we cling to him, we swear to him. All in all, what is Moses saying? How do you love God? You surrender your life completely to God. Amen. Completely to God. And then the third question is, what reasons are we to love God? And there's really two reasons we see in this passage of Scripture why you and I are called to love God. Number one, and this is really all that we need, but again, there's two here in this passage. Number one, you and I, the reason why we are, to, we are to love God, here it is, it's so profound, your brains are going to explode right now. Because he's God. Right? We love God because, my daughter laughed at that, thank you, daughter. Good father's joke, right? Yeah, thank you, Adam. Anyone else want to giggle real quick before I move on? We love God because he's God. Again, look at some of the things that Moses says here about God. He says, God owns heaven, the highest heaven, and all that is in the earth. It says God owns it. All the earth, by the way, he owns it. I don't care that your mortgage has your name on it. God owns your house. I don't care that Trump was elected president. God owns this land and owns everything. God owns all things. It also says, he is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. We just sang that earlier this morning with how great is our God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It says he is great and mighty and awesome. It says that God does not show partiality or he takes a bribe, good thing. He executes justice, it says. He shows his love for the alien by giving them food and clothing. I love what this says. 
It says he is your praise. It doesn't say he's worthy to be praised or he should be praised. He, it just says flat out, he is your praise. Moses is basically saying, guys, God simply is just your praise. God. Like, that's it. God. He is your praise. And your life, it's just God. He says, he is your God who has done great and awesome things, which you have seen. Verse 21. So we see here just how awesome and who God is. And he is worthy of praise, and he is our praise, and he is worthy of our love and our affection, and he is worthy of our fear. He is worthy of our commitment. He is worthy of our servant. He is worthy of our uncircumcised heart. He is worthy of our unstiffed neck. He is worthy of us clinging on to him. He is worthy that we swear our life to him. Because he is simply God. But just in case if that's not enough, we see another reason here. Another reason why we eat or love God. And it's found in verse 15. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is this day. He reminds Israel here. It was God out of his love, who chose you through Abraham. It was God out of his love who chose you when you were just 70 going into Egypt. And even to this day right now, as your population is great, as many stars in heaven, it is still God who chooses you above any other nation. He chose Israel. Israel didn't choose him. And he chose Israel because he loves them. And Israel is to love him because he first loved them. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, says that we love God because God first loved us. So why do we love him? We love him because he loved us first. He chose us. And his sovereign plan in his amazing beauty grace, he chose us. He didn't look at Eric and say, oh, Eric's got it all together, I'm going to choose. No, out of his love, he chose Eric. Out of his love, he created me. And out of his love, despite my sickness and my rebellion and my sinfulness, which I continue to do to this day, while I was a sinner and still am a sinner, Christ died on the cross for me. He has loved me first by his grace. And because of that, I ought to most certainly love him. We need to love our God. Now, my sermon time is done, and I still have a, another part of this sermon, but the good news is this. As we talk about loving the nations, I just preached on this a couple Sundays ago. You could easily go online and listen to the sermon that we talked about in which we are called to love others. That if we don't have love for others, we can't be on mission. So I'm not going to go through that whole sermon again. But just for a few moments, let me just hit on a couple key things from that sermon. As we go from a second, uh, we go from this transition of loving God to now loving the nations. Because remember, Jesus says, love the Lord God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And all the laws will fall underneath these two. And we see very clearly here, yes, Israel is to love God. But it also says that they are to what? Verse 19. So show your love for the alien. Other word for alien here could be nations. In fact, if it's okay with you, and I think it's okay with God, I'd like to substitute that word alien for nations so we can see it better. So show your love for the nations. For you are a nation, an other nation, an alien nation, when you went to the land of Egypt. Why is it important to love 
the nations. And the nations, yes, can be those in Congo, and the, the nations could be those who are next door to our house. It seems like more and more God is bringing even the nations to us closer and closer. Why are we called to love the nations? Because you and I cannot be disciples and make disciples. You and I cannot be witnesses of God unless it is rooted in love. And if you recall from a couple weeks ago, who are the nations? Who is that neighbor? As we looked in Leviticus, where God says, love your neighbor, that was not something that Jesus just came up with in the Gospels. We see very early on in Leviticus, God calling Israel to love your neighbor. And the neighbors are those who live within Israel. It's the Israelites themselves. They are to love one another. But it's also the aliens that come in. It's the other nations. It's the other strangers. Israel was to be a lighthouse to the nations. So who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is everyone that God brings to our life. And we are to love them. How do we love them? We are to love them in the way that God has loved us. Compassion. Patience. Forgiveness. Mercy. Kindness. Shall I say this as well? Speak in truth. God spoke truth to your heart. We need to speak what the truth of Scripture says. We need to love others in the way that God has loved us. And as we see here in this passage of Scripture, the reason why Israel is called to love the nations and the reason why you and I are called to love the nations. Again, one, because he is God. I don't need to read a list again. He owns all things. He owns all nations. He owns all people. He is a sovereign God who desires to see the nations know that he is Lord and Savior. It says that he is the God of God and the Lord of Lords. Do you think, guys, let's just stop for a second, that God wants to see people worship false gods? Or does he want to see them, as we sang in that psalm, not worship false gods and have emptiness come from their lips? Remember Psalm 16 we just sang this morning? That second verse was powerful. And it's great that we can sing it for ourselves. I don't want to sing and worship false gods and have emptiness come from my lips. Do we have a heart for others to do the same thing? Or are we completely satisfied being in this historical sanctuary, singing psalms like we sing because, hey, we're saved, we're okay. Do we have a heart and desire for all of those who are worshiping false gods and lifting up empty lips right now? Because God sure does, I'll tell you that right now. Because Jesus will, the Bible says, be exalted. Every knee will bow down. And every tongue will confess. Our heart and our prayer should be that we see people do that now in a posture of salvation. Not when everything's said and done and he returns and they realize it's too late and they bow down and confess that he is Lord in a posture of realization that they missed it. He is God and deserves to be worshipped as God. And we should love the nations to see the nations come to know him. But he also reminds Israel that you yourself was an alien. And yet Egypt brought you in. God opened up a door for you to be taken care of by Egypt. So that you wouldn't die in the midst of a famine. And you multiplied in your time there. And yeah, they went through slavery and all that. But look where they're at now. They're literally at the Jordan getting ready to cross over into the promised land. You and I were once aliens to the gospel. We were enemies to the gospel. Strangers to the gospel. But at some point in your life, God has called you into a relationship with him. At some point in his life, his love bursted open the floodgates of your hearts. And he redeemed you. And you are a son and daughter of his. You are not a stranger to God. You are not an alien to God. You are not dead in your sins. You are alive in Christ, a son and daughter of his. And now he desires to use you 
in your homes, workplaces, backyards, communities, and yes, even Salem Reform tucked in here behind the cornfields in Searfoss for the nations so that strangers and enemies of him could come to know who Jesus Christ is. The central focus of our Christian life is love the Lord and love the nations. If you're able, will you please stand with us as we sing our closing song, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Hymn number 552, if you want to use your hymnals. As we depart here today with our blessing and sin, and let's all together recite the Nicene Creed, which we'll find up on the screen here. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth.
Matthew 22, verse 40, which is the verse on the bottom of your bulletin, all the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. And what were those two commandments? Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Holy Spirit, empower us to do that. Empower us to love you and love your neighbors here this week. We pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.